Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the College of Environmental Design Circus Soiree. I'm delighted to be here with you this evening. Um, I don't know if I can actually keep this hat on, but uh, so I won't. But it was a good way to good way to start, right? Um, I'm really pleased to be here, uh, especially after spending the, the last day and a half with our 2011 uh, CED Distinguished Fellows on campus, um, where we saw, uh, a, a, saw and learned about a, f a really fabulous range of work done by the students of the, of the college. Um, we learned a lot from this year's experience. We had a great feedback session this morning. Um, and we're looking forward to making it happen bigger and better uh, next year. A lot of people worked really hard on this evening's event as well as um, the events over the last uh, day and a half. And I want to recognize those folks who contributed so much. So if you're in the audience when I call you, please stand up so everybody can recognize you. First of all, faculty and staff at the college worked really hard to make every, everything um, happen. And uh, I know we have faculty in the, in the audience tonight. Um, and, and in addition, um, I wanted to single out, uh, the, first of all, the 2011 Distinguished uh, Fellows of the college, um, Mary Kakoma and her colleagues, uh, including Adrian Wesolowski, Evelyn Kelsey, Carrie Holmquist, Andy Probosco, Adam Isik, and Christina Huang, who so ably organized the events, including this evening. I also want to recognize Tom Burrish, the chair of the Department of Architecture, and his coordinating team, which included Patrick Lynch, Elizabeth McDonald, and Daphne Edwards. And um, uh, that was a group ably supported by um, staff members uh, uh, Eli Persick, Lori Twitchell, and Joe Guig. I also want to recognize Waverly Lowell um, of the Environmental Design Archive, um, who prepared a, a wonderful tour for us, and also uh, environmental design librarian Elizabeth Byrne. Um, last but certainly not least, a whole variety of students got awards yesterday, and, um, and so I want to congratulate them and also their faculty supervisors. So please stand. If you are among the group that I just recognized, please stand, and I will hope everybody will give us a round of applause. Now, truth be told, our students do win an amazing number of awards for their work, and rightly so. They are, without doubt in my humble opinion, the brightest, most creative, and dedicated students at Cal. Um, and they go on to play a wide range of critical roles in the, uh, in the broader world. Now, I think this, uh, this evening's and this year's uh, Distinguished Alumni Awardees could not be better proof of this point. Um, I'm honored and very much humbled to be able to make this year's Distinguished Alumni Awards to some of the most remarkable people you can imagine. So um, I'm going to introduce these uh, Distinguished Alumni, and when I uh, introduce them, I would like to ask them to come up on the stage and, re and receive their medals, okay? Um, let me see. Our first Distinguished Alumni Award is made to architect Peter Dodge. Uh, a founding principal of Escherich, Holmesy, Dodge, and Davis, Peter played a significant role in the growth of EHDG architecture as a firm identified with design excellence. Peter uh, joined um, Joe Escherich's practice on completion of his degree at Cal, um, and in 1963, he became an associate and then a principal in 1972, when EHDD had 30 uh, professionals and a reputation for elegant homes and a few distinguished and larger projects. By the end of his term with EHDD in 1997, there were some 80 architects working at uh, EHDD on complex uh, uh, projects for prominent commercial and institutional clients as well as residential clients. Since 1997, Peter has been a consulting founding principal to EHDD Architecture, maintaining his office at EHDD, where he's easily consulted by colleagues. Um, Peter was president of the corporation from 1979 to 1985, and during his tenure, during which time he led the design uh, of an enormous range of residential and institutional work, EHDD earned the AIA California uh, the AIA California Council Firm Award um, in 1980, and also the National AIA Firm of the Year Award in 1986. And at that time, the uh, EHD 
EHDD was the only firm to have um, achieved both of these distinctions. Um, since 1997, Peters uh, continued to be an active designer, working on residential, institutional, and commercial projects, both in the US and internationally. Um, I should also say that Peter was inst uh, instrumental in establishing the college's alumni association and, in fact, this very award. Um, Peter is also, <laughs> and so he's finally getting it. So Peter is one of the only architects um, who has a, had a local government name a day in his honor. Um, and this is what San Francisco did, and I think it, it is um, very much uh, appropriate. And in, 19, in 2002, the AIA California Council bestowed the Lifetime Achievement Award on Peter. After explaining all their reasons, and there were enormous numbers of reasons to uh, give Peter this award, the, nomin the nominators simply told the council, Peter Dodge rocks. So <laughs> Peter, please approach the stage. Our second Distinguished Alumni Award is made to Therese McMillan. Therese received her bachelor's uh, degree in environmental policy and planning, from, and planning analysis from UC Davis, and then did her joint degree uh, in city and regional planning and, um, and uh, engineering, civil engineering from Cal. Um, she was actually in the first class of these joint degree students uh, of, in what was a new degree. Um, she was appointed deputy administrator of the Federal Transit Administration in July of 2009. And before her appointment, Therese was the deputy executive director for policy at the San Francisco Bay Area's Metropolitan Transportation Commission, MTC. Serving in this role for nine years, Therese was responsible for strategic financial planning and MTC's manage management of federal, state, and regional fund sources for transit, highways, roadways, and other modes. She also led state and federal legislative advo advocacy and public affairs and community outreach. In addition, she, saw planning, she oversaw planning, including long-range plans for transportation and land use, um, air quality and freight issues, and she played a major role in integrating land use and transportation planning. <clears throat> Luckily for generations of leaders to come, for the last six years, Therese has also taught a course in transportation funding and finance uh, for the Graduate Transportation Studies Program um, for the Mineta Transportation Institute at um, California State University at San Jose. Therese is, um, as a, is, is as a thoughtful, engaged, dedicated, and consummately skilled public servant. Um, I think, uh, I believe, Teresa is really a model for city and regional planners in the Bay Area and actually uh, throughout the nation. So, Teresa, please approach and get your award. Our third Distinguished Alumni Award is made to Topher Delaney, who received her BA in Landscape Architecture at UC Berkeley after studying cultural anthropology and philosophy at Barnard College. Topher's career as an environmental artist and builder has encompassed a wide breadth of projects which focus on the development of cultural narratives scribed into exterior landforms, reflecting the values of the personal and also the communal. Her sites range in scale from the intimate to the expansive, and uh, include uh, corporate rooftop gardens, sanctuary gardens for medical facilities, and public art installations. Um, yesterday, we were lucky enough, some of us, to see um, a, the range of her work, was, which was really astounding. The work of Seam, which is Topher Studio, has been exhibited internationally. In her projects, various symbols and forms, from braille to informational markers to Morse code to sculptural icons, are translated into the physical text of the installation 
to be revealed through personal knowledge and experience. Topher's insightful and critical uh, work crosses disciplinary divides, bringing together philosophy and spirituality with a range of building materials, soil, and plants to produce plower, powerful landscapes that are at once lively, colorful, wildly unorthodox, and deeply rooted in nature and ecological pr uh, process. Topher, please come get your award. So Topher admonished me for not talking about the Airedales. Um, we both have or had Airedales. Um, they're really devilish dogs. Anyway, um, I am now very pleased indeed to welcome our speaker for this evening for the soiree. Um, uh, and of course, this is Teddy Cruz. Teddy Cruz is an architect and founding principal of Estudio Teddy Cruz in San Diego, and he's a professor of public culture and urbanism in the Department of Visual Studies at UC San Diego. He received undergraduate degrees from Rafael Landivar University in Guatemala City, as well as Cal uh, State po uh, Poly at San Luis Obispo. Um, and after he received the Rome Prize, uh, he went on to complete a master's in design at Harvard University's GSD. Over the past decade, Teddy has demonstrated a deep commitment to advocating architectural and urban planning uh, projects that address the global, political, and social problems that become manifest on the ground along the international border between C uh, San Diego and Tijuana, Mexico. His work has inspired a practice and a pedagogy that emerges out of the complexities and the, the specific challenges of this bicultural and binational territory. And it strives for the integration of theoretical research with design production and practice. In particular, his work is informed and influenced by informal structures that emerge from a community's need for housing and for public space. Uh, Estudio Teddy Cruz is widely known for the work on housing and its relationship to the broader urban fabric and public life. In particular, um, Estudio has collaborated with community-based nonprofit organizations. One example is Teddy's work with Casa Familiar, which advocates for and assists the marginal community in uh, such areas as immigration, services, education, and job placement. Their collaborative uh, plans for senior housing with childcare and also multi-use outdoor and indoor community spaces um, has received wide acclaim and was included in the recent uh, show at uh, MoMA in, in New York, Small Scale Big Change. Um, and that, that focused specifically on uh, new architectures of social engagement. Teddy Cruz has also created in innovative new institutional bases for design research and exploration that includes students and colleagues. He founded the Border Institute, dedicated to research on border urbanism at Woodbury University, and at UC San Diego, he's founded the Center for Urban Ecologies. Teddy's work and writing is widely published. He's a recipient of a PA award, the Robert Taylor Teaching Award from the American Collegiate Schools of Architecture, and numerous AIA honor awards. In 2005, he was the first recipient of the James Sterling Memorial Lecture on the City Prize, and his work has been profiled in important publications, including the New York Times, Domus, and The Nation. In 2008, he represented the U.S. in the Venice Architectural Biennale, and just this past December, Teddy was one of two architects awarded a United States Artists Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Teddy Cruz. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I need to borrow that biographical note. It's excellent. <laughs> You assembled it, I guess, a lot better than I could have ever. Uh, let's see, I hope this is, let me just get located here. Um, for some reason, the computer disconnected uh, the electricity, so let me see. Uh, hold on a moment. I think it's fine. Perfect. <coughs> Is this has to be this, I imagine this intense for 
Any purpose? If it can be lower, that would be great. No. Anyway, let's let's dive into the images. I, I, I actually perfect. Thank you. I without my images, I'm no one. Um, <laughs> I, I'm very privileged, really, to, to be invited to be part of this presentation. Thank you very much, and I mean the relevance of, of the meeting uh, here, but also for me, you know, being part of the UC family. Uh, now that we are in crisis, we need to help each other, and I think that uh, coming from San Diego, for me, less than an hour away, I'm all of a sudden in a place that is a lot more civilized, uh, and so I'm very happy to be here. And I think that this needs to happen more. I've been talking to the, about these two friends in UCLA and here that I teach in a visual arts department. And I really miss the School of Architecture and the kind of masochism and the kind of uh, the kind of workaholic attitude, you know, work ethic. So I'm I'm, I'm happy to to reconnect. Um, <clears throat> let me dive into the images because I couldn't edit, and I'm just going to take you through a series of stories very quickly that have really inspired the transformation of my practice in the last years as I've been engaging the specificity of the political in this very contested territory, which is the San Diego Tijuana border, uh, and my work in the very particular neighborhood adjacent. To the, to the most trafficked check, check, checkpoint in the world. Uh, I would begin, uh, I could not avoid beginning uh, without sharing uh, for, for a moment one of the most inspirational statements I've heard in the last years, not from an architect, not from a writer, not from a philosopher or an artist, but in fact from the chief commander of the uh, war in, in Iraq, uh, then uh, uh, General Petraeus, who uh, when he came back uh, after his first tour in the war, and he gave his first reports uh, to Congress, I, you know, this is an article that was published in the New York Times, I was incredibly amazed and, and surprised about his first uh, statement. He said, uh, contemporary soldier needs to transform. It cannot be anymore this sort of robot-like figure that controls the war at a distance. Uh, uh, that can be armed with every gadget, uh, in a sense. Uh, uh, the contemporary soldier needs to transform into a social worker, he said, into an anthropologist, and needs to be versed in many languages. And when I said, uh, when I heard that, you know, I said to myself, my God, if the contemporary soldier needs to transform, why can't we architects, in a sense, that does not mean that we would have to become social workers, but maybe we could borrow, of course, the procedures of the other and contaminate each other with other types of protocols. But at the same time, for me, it was an incredible surprise that, again, the right was beginning to borrow <laughs> the kind of uh, attitudes and strategies and tactics of the left, which has been fundamentally, radically kind of surprising in the last years, of course. Not only this became an important uh, statement, because he also mentioned that the war had not been fought at a distance, but out of a very close proximity to the social networks, to the familial relationships. It's a war that was fought on the, on, in neighborhoods. So for me, this represented a kind of moment of suggesting a very different shift to the orientation, let's say, of our, our specializations. That the perennial understanding of the historic avant-garde had always depended on a critical distance from the institutions in order to critique them from the exterior. Well, in fact, at this moment, we are uh, engaged in a very different attitude that uh, is more to do with a kind of critical proximity to levels of specificity in order to engage the very nature and the ultimate mechanisms, institutionally and otherwise, of the political, social, and economic realities that we are really unable to understand as we speak. So this notion of radicalizing the local for me became an, an important, not only a, a conceptual framework to convince me that it was okay to stay in San Diego, okay, <laughs> but also to engage the border in more uh, uh, radical ways. Um, <clears throat> I was um, lucky to be invited uh, to, to the Venice Biennale a, a, a couple of years ago, and I used that as an opportunity to a, a, a elaborate further on this idea of uh, uh, the radicalizing the local, and I decided to cut a cross-section between San Diego and Tijuana. Most of my work has, in a sense, been dedicated and committed to the neighborhoods adjacent to the wall. And the wall, in, in some way, has become a, a kind of symbol uh, of, of the practice. But more than anything, I'm interested in the conditions that really transcend and transgress this formidable barrier. So the section between San Diego and Tijuana, uh, I called it radicalizing the local 60 linear miles of transborder conflict. Some of you who might know this uh, region, I mean, this drawing, which is a typical figure ground uh, drawing, uh, reverses the equation. The black areas are leftover spaces just to dramatize how Tijuana crashes against the wall in a kind of zero setback while San Diego retreats. And the Tijuana River, after coming from an Alamar branch of the Colorado River, enters into Tijuana and then exits back into San Diego. 
Um, so this uh, condition of cutting literally 60 linear miles, 30 miles deep into San Diego, 30 miles deep into Tijuana, collecting along that trajectory a series of moments, physical manifestations of the inscription of global conflict in the context of the local, where co ecologies clash, maybe top-down forces of urbanization with social or natural uh, uh, bottom-up uh, conditions and so on. So beginning 30 miles deep into San Diego, uh, we might witness a conflict between top-down development and the topography as developers have begun to flatten the differential of uh, uh, canyons in the edges of Del Mar to install their cheap recipes of suburbanization in the shape of master plan gated communities. Or down below, the conflict between large freeway infrastructure and the watershed. These strange spaces, these cavernous spaces where the freeway collides with the natural hydrology of the land as it descends into the coastal cities, the conflict between gated communities and everyday life, or as my friend Rebecca Solnit called it, the apartheid of everyday life, of social life in many of these master plan gated communities, the conflict between military bases and environmental zones. This, as you might know, uh, the otherwise continuous development from Los Angeles to Tijuana, the only places where that is interrupted is where we find the military bases that in turn are overlaid with environmental zones, this perennial uh, juxtaposition and complicity, as, I guess, between systems of militarization and urbanization and also with environmental systems. The conflict between formal and informal densities and economies, I will get that in more detail later, as many neighborhoods in San Diego are beginning to retrofit themselves with, in the hands of many immigrants. The conflict between two cities that repel and are indifferent to each other politically and in many other ways. And as, as soon as we cross the border, as that image that I showed you where the river enters the border, uh, becoming this channel, this concretized channel, enters San Diego, becoming the Tijuana River estuary, the collision between the river and the border almost tangentially, and the conflict between informal and natural ecologies are also, as also shanty towns encroach into uh, the natural systems in Tijuana, the conflict between factories and emergency housing, as many of these maquiladoras place themselves in the middle of the slums to borrow labor without giving anything in return, the conflict between density and sprawl, as also Mexican developers are reproducing the cheap recipes of suburbanization of San Diego developers to create these huge master plan gated communities in miniature to solve the problem of social housing in the edges of any Latin American city. And finally, at the end of this other, this section, this 30 mile, uh, 60 mile uh, cross section, probably the, the, the mama, I would call it, of all conflicts, okay? The conflict between the natural and the political. When the wall that ha after traversing miles and miles in the Tijuana territory, the border wall finally sinks into the Pacific Ocean, creating this strange site that is both, of course, strangely poetic, but ultimately hugely tragic. And juxtaposed against this panorama of this uh, very uh, emblematic image, a cross section, this local, this cross section of local conflict. And to amplify the drama of these conditions, of course, I always say that there is no other place in the world where we can find in less than 60 miles away from each other, on the bookends of this section, some of the wealthiest real estate, as the one found in Rancho Santa Fe where the Priskers live, barely 40, 30 minutes away from some of the poorest settlements in Latin America. This radical proximity of wealth and poverty continues to define cities from Dubai to China to, you know, to, to New York to San Diego, always depending on migrant labor to the construction of the urban imaginary, etc. So conflict as an operational tool, almost forensically reviewing and retracing ourselves to understand the institutional mechanisms that ultimately provoked the crisis in the first place, without understanding what were the conditions that produced the crisis across many of these registers. It's very difficult to make sense of our own procedures as designers and as researchers. So my practice has been trying to uh, sort of make sense of many of these conditions, uh, straddling, of course, the uh, strategies of the informal in many of the slums in Tijuana, and primarily the politics of discriminating zoning in San Diego, these uh, transborder suburbias that are very different to each other, but also defined by invisible flows between San the south and the north, and north and the south, that have been the inspiration for my practice. I should run in, uh, faster into this because many of you might be familiar with this, but I couldn't avoid always uh, framing the discussion uh, in the context of these images. I'm just talking literally about the flow uh, from north to south of waste, uh, San Diego, uh, uh, older first ring of suburbanization 
uh, uh, suburbs have begun to dismantle themselves in the th last 30, 40 years, and their debris is, is transferred into Tijuana. These are bungalows that are uh, brought to Tijuana. These are houses waiting to cross the border from San Diego into Tijuana. And when these houses cross the border, they are put on top of these metal frames, leaving the first floor to become the second, to be infilled by other narratives, other uses, other programs. This sort of club sandwich, as I call it, of urbanism, uh, the layering of opposites. This is a, my favorite one. It's a, a man who wanted his most uh, precious dream, I guess, was to have a pink track home from San Diego while maintaining his car repair shop beneath. I think this, this sort of uh, approximation of opposite is very fundamental here uh, as metaphors, but also as operative uh, uh, processes. Uh, tires that are now have been rethought as a system, not just the static tires, but now look at how people out of social economic emergency, they've figured out a constructive system by which they are able to thread them into a more functional retaining wall. Uh, so again, in conditions of social economic emergency, creativity flourishes. But I'll get back to a moment to suggest that I'm not trying to glorify or romanticize poverty here. I'm interested, in fact, in the creative intelligence behind the construction of these environments, but also in understanding the political economy of waste, because this is an essential process to maintain the sustainability of these environments. Garage doors that are transferred uh, en masse from Riverside, San Diego, and Southern California to Tijuana to construct entire uh, social housing, or at least emergency housing. The garage doors of those older houses in the first ring of suburbanizations of Southern California now become the houses of these slums. So in this uh, sort of uh, the juxtaposition of systems is a very f a kind of dramatic phenomenon, of course, that these uh, older levy towns of San Diego, as they have begun to road themselves as developers are building an inflated version of those older levy towns. Their debris has been transferred 20 minutes south to construct the new periphery, the new kind of suburbs uh, of Tijuana. Levy town has been recycled into Tijuana's slum. But again, it's not the informal as an image. The image of the informal is that what has seduced many architects in our time, and that sometimes I am niched as one of those sort of shanty architects, you know, that uh, is trying to glorify these sort of conditions. I'm, I'm arguing that it's not the image or the aesthetics of the informal, even though I cannot deny that these environments are incredibly beautiful, but it's really the logics, the operative logics behind their procedures, socioeconomically, ultimately, politically, and in terms of social organization. Uh, out of this phenomena, or drama of these images, which are always important. I think we as architects uh, understand the world through images. Uh, I think these images have uh, a potency in really suggesting procedures, uh, the conflicts embedded in those images. So the conflict is always a, a point of departure for our projects. The conflict in Tijuana has been uh, the one between factories and the slums around them because factories uh, place themselves tactically, strategically in the context of these slums to borrow labor without giving anything in return. And these are incredible resources. So our, our project, and I will not dwell on this project too much because the, it is continuing to evolve, uh, but uh, I just wanted to give a sense of uh, one and the other side. Uh, the project has not to rush as an architect to the slum to solve the problem of uh, dwelling with building houses. I am at odds with that kind of attitude. I would, it, it, it was just not really at advancing at all the construction of community or to really dealing with the foundational sort of problems or crisis. We went to the factory instead. I'm interested in these detours in order to get probably to housing. We engaged a Spanish maquiladora, which is the one that produces these pallet racks to be exported all over the world from Tijuana called Mecalux, and they allowed us uh, uh, to construct a series of frames uh, out of the systems of production, material systems in, uh, uh, in the factory to then uh, uh, produce this frame that would, uh, a, would be able to stitch uh, much of that waste in, in the similar ways as the, as the, as the retaining walls, the, the tire walls, uh, uh, old uh, joist systems, uh, in, including the houses and the, and the garage doors. The idea was, of course, literally a, a, a condition of this sort of uh, 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 urbanism of acupuncture has been in the map for, 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 for many years, in a sense. But how do we enable the visualization of these transactions? And we em embed into that transaction between factories, community activism, 
emergency housing and, and, and subsidies, a kind of system of, of relationship. I've been interested very much in the idea of a cultural pimp, where the architect serves as a kind of mediator and facilitator of new collaborations across the kind of institutions that have remained, in fact, divided. Without altering those uh, protocols, it's very difficult to imagine particular construction systems that at least I'm interested in enabling. So this sort of portable new Babylon of sorts that enables this sort of visualization of these transactions, but also is embedded in the logics of uh, distribution and uh, activism in these environments. But the, the primary uh, interest in my practice has been the, the impact of immigration, of immigrants, in the transformation of the American uh, neighborhood. Uh, the impact of immigrants as they uh, come and, 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 and arrive to older, those older subdivisions that I was talking about. So in a sense, it's a double story. I always call it this way, the double destiny of Levittown. One was to erode itself and dismantle itself to be transferred to the border city, but the other was a, a kind of idea of retrofitting, of course, of Levittown and producing new possibilities towards land, land use and policy. So these maps that I've been constructing and this narrativization of this process has been important as a visual artist. Uh, very simple maps. I think we've been, as an, in terms of the School of Architecture, uh, seduced by complexity for complexity's sake. Even though it's been interesting to actually deal with the kind of palimpsest of diagramming to really unearth the kind of conditions that shape the territory, to rethink our ideas of infrastructure, those images continue to hide, in a sense, the kind of uh, 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 empowering possibility to become political. So these images are very simple. In this case, in this case, the splicing of two conditions of land use across the border, because between these two cities, there's no collaboration, really, to visualize some of those. Uh, there is no transborder land use planning, uh, uh, land use map that is uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, 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 reproducing some of these logics. So the large swatches of color in San Diego and the high pixelation of these more compacted and more complex land use conditions in Tijuana, and I've been arguing that, in fact, this uh, confetti of illegal zoning has begun to seep in, uh, con uh, contaminating, altering the largeness okay, of these uh, large chunks of color and depositing itself ultimately in the small parcels of many of these marginal neighborhoods that have become the site of investigation for my practice. Physicalizing themselves, of course, in the small parcels, uh, transforming them into small socioeconomic systems. In this case, my practice has been interested in challenging the notion of the global city or globalization for that matter. Uh, I think that the global city in the last years of glamorous economy became the privileged site, in fact, of display and consumption while marginal neighborhoods around the world remain, in fact, sites of cultural production. Not only that, but I would aspire to suggest the, the sites of a new or kind of alternative economic frameworks and sociability. Uh, I'm interested in understanding the mechanisms by which this house, this, this old bungalow in the neighborhood of City Heights, was transformed into a Buddhist temple 25 years ago. And in so doing, not only the, the house and the parcel transforms, out of these uh, systems of retrofit and adaptation. I'm interested in the possibility of an urbanism of adaptation at this very moment in time, but also how this small Buddhist temple in the neighborhood uh, rethinks or allows us to rethink the idea of citizenship, primarily at this very moment, as you have uh, uh, been aware of what is going on in Arizona and many other places in this, in this country. They're suggesting the, 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 the need to conceptualize new types of interpretations of citizenship. Uh, the citizenship is, in this case, not just the kind of paperwork that uh, enables you to be part of a private club, but in fact, it's a creative act. Small deeds, small everyday deeds that reformulate, reconfigure, and alter existing protocols and existing institutional mechanisms. So embedded in these transactions of transgression across boundaries, of the retrofitting of these uh, small parcels illegally, there is embedded in that a creative act that really would allow us to rethink the very nature of zoning, the very nature of land use. And this is something that needs to be pointed out, primarily at a time when we are really engaging the possibility of rethinking density, away from our very reductive and abstract notions. Density continues to be measured like this, as an amount of units per acre, as an amount of people per acre, and in many of these neighborhoods that I've been interested in researching, uh, density is measured differently. An amount of socioeconomic exchanges per acre, 
And of course, that is off the radar of the institutions. It's been probably the most difficult thing to engage sociologically, anthropologically, architecturally, urbanistically, etc. I am, uh, couldn't avoid also sharing another story, which is called Compendium of Voice, a Chronology of an Invasion, um, which, uh, which suggests that these uh, tactics of retrofit are not only in the hands of immigrants, but also of teenagers. And for me, it has been an interesting also uh, uh, on, uh, process of understanding uh, or engaging the, the nature of leftover spaces in Southern California, in this context of this sort of selfish urbanization, the kind of islands, the archipelago of emptiness that is remaining, and that at the same, uh, uh, most of the time as architects or landscape architects, which you see through the eyes of the poetic, but never really through the political, because it's in fact a very strange, backward, stupid planning, what has ultimately produced the kind of fragmentation that we have experienced across jurisdictions and communities. Many of these islands are in fact defined by very specific policies. Let's call it uh, setbacks, easements, brownfields, etc. The one that has been more uh, sort of interesting to understand for me was, has been the paper streets, uh, which as you all know, uh, uh, is really having to do with streets that were never built because of topographic conditions and made it too expensive. But uh, these invisible chunks of public resources are being only capitalized by developers who really claim them out of a process called street vacation, as you know, and then becoming private property. This is what I've been arguing to uh, my students, artists and architects to really reclaim this sort of invisible, the kind of visualization of these invisible uh, resources. There are paper freeways in San Diego all of them surrounded by, in fact, incredible resources. The invisibility of socioeconomic infrastructures in many of these neighborhoods is unbelievable in relationship to physical emptiness. Uh, paper streets, uh, elementary schools, nonprofit organizations surrounding these islands of emptiness, they could begin uh, to relate to each other. And I think this is where inter uh, the kind of process of mediation begins to occur. The story has to do with this one of these islands in this sort of archipelago of voids, which is the collision of freeway and neighborhood near my neighborhood in San Diego. And I began to uh, interview a series of teenagers who one day, a few years ago, uh, decided en masse uh, to invade this leftover space, uh, tired because they didn't have any place, any public space to really uh, skateboard. And they decided to get shovels from Home Depot. And one night, they came and invaded this underpass. And this is the image, in fact, of the parcel when I went to the municipality as they measured this leftover space. Uh, as I began to talk to them, uh, to the teenagers, I mean, they uh, began to dig uh, for two weeks. The police came, they stopped them, uh, and they decided, the teenagers, to fight back. Uh, and the first thing they did, they, they have been telling me, because I'm composing a video about this narrative, is that they had to recognize the power, uh, again, uh, the kind of political power inscribed in that particular juncture. And for me, that became one of the most amazing lessons that we never really engaged as students of architecture or beyond. That the first act in intervening into the city is the recognition of who owns and whose territory is this anyway. The kind of uh, understanding of the political specificity, the, the, the specificity of jurisdiction, the power, the political power uh, inscribed in that particular environment. They talked about that they were lucky because they had not begun to dig in Caltrans territory because otherwise it would have been incredibly difficult to negotiate. They were lucky because they dug under an arm of a freeway that belonged to the city. They were lucky also, they said, because they had begun to dig in a Bermuda Triangle of jurisdiction uh, between Port Authority, Aeroport Authority, two city districts, and a review board kind of in the Pacific Coast Highway. Nobody wanted to claim liability for this. The, the, the teenagers then organized themselves as skaters, which is another aspect. Many of these actions begin to emerge out of a very interesting and sophisticated models of social organization, uh, micro communities of practice, as I call them. These skaters uh, engage city officials, uh, uh, city attorney and city councils. Uh, they were advised that they had to become an NGO if they wanted to negotiate this. Uh, they became an NGO, they created an operation, they contacted other skateboarders in, in, in Northern California that had gone through the same issue. This exchange of knowledge out of these uh, activist practices is an important uh, condition. They had to also get a lawyer, construction insurance budgets, they had to be aware of every single department that had fragmented all the budgets for producing or enabling an interp interpretation and activation of public space. They had to uh, be aware of every permit, right of entry, land use, encroachment, 
the knowledge not only of the political power inscribed in that juncture, but also the economic power inscribed in that juncture that continued to be fragmented. In the end, the uh, skaters, just to tell you the story in very brief uh, gestures, won the case and out of a transfer of liability were able to claim uh, a management of this space and build their skateboard park. For me, a, an, an essential aspect here is that an act of transgression an act of informal sort of uh, infiltration into these spaces can trickle up to transform the institutions. And this is what I'm trying to suggest when so ma many people denigrate the informal as just a kind of juvenile uh, romanticization of uh, the informal primarily, I think, is a process by which uh, 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 these protocols institutionally are transgressed, the transgression of political frameworks. Uh, in, in that sense, for me, it's an essential possibility that these uh, uh, con uh, conditions begin to uh, uh, elevate themselves to transform the top down. As an architect, of course, uh, I am interested in the top down, but we need to reframe the ground in order to get to those transformations. But this idea of pixelating the large with the small has remained in my mind as a kind of future of Southern California. Uh, and I've been interested also in processes of visualization that engage the public, this uh, kind of connection between the civic imagination that is needed to be reframed. I was invited for a, a show in the Museum of Modern Art in New York to, in, a, in the context of suburbia or landscapes. And I uh, op uh, took that opportunity to produce this installation sort of in homage to Archizoom uh, and uh, kind of a non-stop sprawl. I measured the most generic track home in San Diego, 9,000 square feet, uh, and I build the model. Uh, we build the model faithfully, replicating this and put it in this mirrored box to repeat it infinitely. And uh, above it, there were two videos: one of a series of immigrants that I filmed in front of the house, telling the stories or imagining how this house would transform. And on the left, there was a video that would, in fact, take those ideas or those transformations literally. Uh, the idea again of these uh, tactics and strategies of retrofit. I was just talking yesterday to Jean Philippe Vassal, who came to San Diego to give a lecture at UCSZ, and it was incre incredible. He says, you know, Teddy, you know, we shouldn't be looking for new territories on which to build. We should retrofit one building at a time. And this is something that is really resonates in the context of Southern California. Now, this is not just about the addition and the plugging of the farmer's markets at Nauseum. <laughs> this is about the complete redefinition of ownership. Primarily in our time, I think, when we have uh, understood that the crisis, the current crisis originated by people given, being given cheap lending that they, they could never really repay, uh, that the American dream collapsed in conditions of marginality and poverty, that not everybody can own or even rent a unit. So I think it is necessary to suggest that in many of these neighborhoods, as two ladies uh, rent a three-bedroom apartment to transform it illegally into a nursery, and that that can be plugged into the kind of social and economic programming of these community-based practices or NGOs, could be, begin to rethink uh, partnerships and models uh, of uh, 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 property, the rethinking of property. I've been interested in this context then in the expansion of my own practice. From the beginning, I'm not interested in building that much but in, in building a position so that maybe at some point uh, there could be a kind of possibility of rethinking the very nature of experimental architecture in our time. Alternative performance is really the, 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 the kind of uh, one of the issues that I've been interested how to translate much of this invisibility, this creative intelligence into new economic and political models uh, that we as architects could in fact design. Uh, the conflict in San Diego that has been essential in this context has been the conflict between uh, lending and land use. When I realized after years of working in this marginal neighborhood at the border, and one time with my client, the, the director of this nonprofit, the act, uh, my friend, the activist, Andreas Corepa, we were trying to understand why was it that in the last years of incredible glamorous economy, of a huge boom in downtowns aided by the trickling of tax increment into these bubbles of wealth, many of these neighborhoods remain depressed. That not one single affordable housing project was built in the neighborhood of San Isidro, where I've been working in the last 10 years. And the answer was, of course, that for a private developer to invest in a housing project in these environments, uh, they would have to take advantage of tax credits or subsidies, which are, of course, competitive in this country. And to be competitive, this private developer, to make it profitable, this private developer would have to build at least 50 units of housing in many of these projects. But 50 units of housing are prohibited 
in these neighborhoods, many of these neighborhoods. Not only that, but uh, mixed uses and, and high par parking ratios made it very impossible, creating this sort of catch-22 between zoning and lending. And this is where something began to open up in suggesting that we as architects, besides designing buildings, could also participate in the conceptual redesigning of political and economic processes. That the understanding of the top-down institution of economic investment and development in the city that continues to perpetuate the idea that the growth of, of the city only depends on economic value versus what has become also important to uh, many activist practices in our time, the possibility of the social capital, cultural and social value to become a kind of uh, process of exchange that suggests a very different alternative mode of economy. But it's not one or the other. I think that my practice has been interested in mediating the top down and the bottom up uh, in suggesting that new social contracts need to be so, uh, produced uh, in order to design what I've begun to uh, realize becoming a kind of uh, condition of micropolitics. In fact, it was, I think, a book here at Berkeley that I found uh, uh, forgotten in UCSD in one of those uh, used bookstores. Uh, and it was called The Neighborhood as a Political Unit. Uh, for me, it was essential to understand that in many of these conditions, neighborhoods can become sites of exception to what has become a more totalizing, homogenizing idea of zoning. So we be, we've been designing, at least in the case of San Isidro, when I came, began to work with Casa Familiar, a micro-policy uh, that would be lengthy to explain here, but I, didn't, I wanted to put it into the narrative, because it's been essential in my practice in the last uh, uh, 10 years, that would uh, present a new role for these nonprofit organizations working within these neighborhoods. Presenting this to the municipality of San, De San Diego a few years ago to enable our project that we are finally getting permits for and constructing at the end of this year, uh, it is uh, the idea that the nonprofits in this embedded in these neighborhoods could become the think tanks that could begin, begin to measure all the illegal uh, uh, constructions and economies that are off the radar and allowing the municipality to legitimize them. Uh, so this uh, sort of overlay zoning uh, that only pertains to a very small scale uh, in enabling further the nonprofit to become an informal city hall, negotiating information, but also creating partnerships with owners so that both can co-own some of these uh, additions once they need to be retrofitted. So the nonprofit as a facilitator of construction permits, and finally the nonprofit as a, a kind of facilitator of micro uh, loans, I could call it, as this 50 unit base, uh, subsidy based, tax credit based uh, packages are uh, in fact bro uh, broken apart into smaller pieces uh, and prepackaged. So this sort of anticipation of the process that could enable the, co the, the collaboration between dwellers in this neighborhood and the nonprofit uh, by rethinking, uh, somebody has to represent these people. Somebody has to be liable and take the risk in order to really manage. I think that at this point, I'm very interested in the possibility of the, spe the specificity of management. I think that we are moving from issues of representation to issues of management in, in a more tactical and more specific ways. If I had the, the time, I would, call, I would write a book right now called uh, A Call for a Specificity, uh, because we've been navigating the world abstractly and, and neutrally. I think that it's necessary to really get to the very specific uh, nuance and calibration of these exchanges and relationships. From this micropolicy, the idea that the social, uh, cultural, and pedagogical programming of Casa Familiar could inspire a very different arrangement of the articulation of spatially and programmatically of these small par parcels. So plugging housing with support systems became another kind of mini manifesto in our, uh, in our office. That housing cannot exist on its own flanking double loaded corridors to maximize profit for the types of performer that really have presented this sort of homogeneous uh, scale of, 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 of projects. But in fact, that housing in many of these poor neighborhoods needed to be plugged with micro infrastructures of social service, uh, urban pedagogy, uh, and economy. Uh, so this is what has become a part of a kind of manifesto, and therefore probably is the reason we were invited to be part of this show at MoMA called Small Scale Big Change, the parcel conceived as a micro socioeconomic system. Housing, more than shelter, can be an economic engine for uh, these environments. And let me just now show very quickly, if I can hear, because I'm so bad with technology, uh, but uh, the animation that we did for the show uh, at MoMA, because we wanted to convey to the public the, <clears throat> the kind of performance of this parcel. 
I, I'm interested in, the, in, in how these neighborhoods perform. There's a, there's a performative dimension to space here that transcends style and, and form. Uh, the transgression and negotiation of boundaries uh, and resources uh, is, is an important issue. Let's see if it opens up. Yes, uh, in the view. In reality, uh, again, this notion of the performatic, uh, uh, and I would love to talk a little more about this because many of these Hispanic neighborhoods have been hijacked by the chief politics of identity, if, if focusing only on the style of, of, of buildings and not really on uh, how people have negotiated their own uh, modes of, of engaging these boundaries. So again, the neighborhood as a producer of new housing policy and economy, designing parcels as a small infrastructures that mobilize social entrepreneurship into new spaces for housing and political participation. Casa Familiar bought a, a, an old church in an old parcel, uh, a, and then also acquired, because these are the social agencies that are becoming developers of their own housing stock, a, and acquired other parcels next door that we began to subdivide in small uh, landscape slivers that would anticipate a finer pixelation of property. Uh, the church is retrofitted into an incubator of cultural production. This is a kind of a think tank where Casa Familiar will generate new categories of socioeconomic programming. I'm interested in the design of a specific programs that is injected in the, the ambiguity of space. These open frames, which are equipped with electricity, uh, collective kitchens, and mo mo uh, mobile uh, furniture, and of course, the spaces that Casa Familiar will inject with programming, producing new interfaces with the community. I'm interested in enabling a very new uh, relationship uh, with the community. Thursdays, maybe, the community workshops that Casa Familiar has been organizing for, uh, uh, for, for years uh, as a kind of uh, urban pedagogical model or framing an informal economy that happens in the alleys into these parcels as these parcels become, in a sense, alternative micro-public spaces or the incentivizing of the use of the collective kitchen for engaging a, a economic entrepreneurship that already exists here. But the void here is not just uh, more space for more house. It's really a site made available for injecting uh, collective programming to support informal economies and social organization. Then, again, this is a very small parcel, 14,000 square feet. Uh, through that, they're beginning to, uh, the collection uh, of a series of housing economies. The coexistence of very different housing economies embedded in the infrastructure of social services. The church, the social rooms, and the collective kitchen become that infrastructure now within which housing is being stitched. This is a building type uh, one for young couples and single mothers with children, very specifically. Uh, so uh, hoping that uh, the dwellers of these uh, typologies become co-participants and, and co-managers of this, some of these socioeconomic problems. This is not about representing the community symbolically through images, it's really enabling them uh, uh, operationally. Housing two is for uh, artists, it's a duplex, a live work artist, uh, exchanging rent for social services so that the artists will be engaging the actual design of new models of financing, social contrast, and unconventional mixed uses. Uh, this sort of mixity of uh, creative intelligence has been incredibly to, uh, to witness. Uh, also, choreographing pedagogical models. I think that there is so much misinformation that part of the agenda has been to design the systems of interface uh, so that the artists can really uh, produce uh, this type of urban pedagogy or also, now that has become very powerful in our time, social practice as an art tool becoming to be ena enabling here as well. Uh, the typology number three, and this is going a little too slow, uh, <laughs> large families with grandmothers. These are large units. Five bedrooms, the people who live with their grandmothers and sharing kitchens, uh, promoting economic entrepreneurship. Also, as, fam as Casa Familiar being the partner, it, it produces partnerships with them to incentivize uh, a, a small businesses. Uh, then, a, a, out of this a, a typology that continues to be very much uh, undercapitalized of the uh, accessory building which is, in many ways has become the kind of place for more house, but in this case is small sheds also, not only for extended families, but really for creating a level of flexibility in terms of being uh, other types of program, not only uh, housing. But it's, it, it's obvious for many of you to understand that the paradigm has been homogeneous mega blocks, one developer, one architect, one type of housing pro forma. In a small parcel, the coexistence of very different housing economies and types and the careful calibration of programming so that exchanges are choreographed and, and enabled. Again, here, the idea that density cannot be sustainable anymore as just an amount of objects thrown indiscriminately through the territory, and that housing could be, in fact, a system of economic and cultural interactions. Um, let me uh, finish, which I, I am actually 
glad that I'm really uh, making some time here because it's a lot of material. Thank you for your patience. Uh, let me get back to the other uh, piece. So I will uh, sort of uh, move through this uh, quicker because I think it's obvious that it's about redefining infrastructure, uh, that these small spaces can be programmed specifically to produce socialization across a variety of modalities, uh, that also this can be stitched with housing. So this sort of idea of the Tijuana house on top of the undifferentiated space that can in fact suggest a new scheme for each amount of space dedicated to specific dwelling. There is an equal amount of space to mobilize an infrastructure of social service and stitching housing into those systems. This is an important and final point is that I've been interested in this uh, relationship between public policy and the re-engagement of a civic imagination. Uh, I've been realizing that the ultimate gap really has be been uh, between cultural institutions, even universities, and the communities uh, they are surrounded by. So this possibility of re-engaging cultural institutions and publics that easily have been co-opted and hijacked by the cheap politics of fear in this country, I think the incentivizing of a new level of awareness of what does it mean, uh, what, what it means really to, to, to re rethink and reimagine the environment. This has been, in the last years, as you all know, incredibly operational in Latin America. I'm not here fly, uh, fl like I said, uh, moving the Amer Latin American flag at all. It's just that I've been surprised that in the last 15 years of glamorous economy and seeing all uh, the, the sort of the, the, the manifestos of architecture that I admired for many years flock en masse to Dubai and Chinese cities to just camouflage those systems of power, politically and economically, unconditionally, uh, and that nothing was advanced but just the kind of decoration of these uh, conditions. I've been interested in understanding that the true advances in rethinking infrastructure, the relationship of top-down systems of governance and social and economic informal uh, networks was in Latin America. As visionary mayors, as you know it, from Sergio Fajardo with his uh, library parks in Medellin, who shifted the whole direction of the work by just saying, we are not going to build here, we're going to build there. And not only that, but the kind of hybridizing of programs so that public space was not just a decorated neutral space where people would magically appear, but in fact it was about plugging knowledge into those spaces, the kind of uh, uh, projects that uh, uh, appeared in Bogotá, like the Transmillennium project that everybody celebrates, uh, Enrique Peñalosa, but in fact was preceded by a very committed engagement by Antanas Mocus in terms of an urban pedagogy, elevating a kind of civic culture uh, and civic imagination. The projects that happened, retro uh, this I'm going back in, town, uh, in time, because this began in Curitiba with Jamie Lerner and this sort of, so this transference of knowledge Nobody's talking about how these projects informed each other uh, all the way in the late 70s with Porto Alegre's participatory budgets when the mayor there suggested that the communities could have a say in the redistribution of municipal budgets and so on. So this idea of engaging the public has been also part of my work as an artist and I really have been trying to intervene into public space uh, a, a very differently. I recently completed a project in South Korea that I called the Future Neighborhood conversations on coexistence. I was invited by Kion Park as a curator to come and face the problem in these environments in the Asian cities. Uh, when I was sitting in a meeting uh, discussing what we were going to do, they were explaining, of course, that these many neighborhoods in these uh, perif peripheral cities to Seoul are being destroyed to build these homogeneous towers of dwelling. And as I was sitting down, uh, the mullion of the window sort of edited the view, and what I looked at was this sort of bucolic landscape, it reminded me of Southern California, but then I went down like this and I saw that this was just the tip of the towers that in fact were uh, uh, built. What I'm trying to say is that one of the particular conflicts that continues to be unresolved is the conflict between the horizontal and the vertical and how in this case, in many of these cities are ignoring the fabric, the kind of performance of these older neighborhoods and communities that also the activists behind them do, are not aware of what the spaces do and, and how they enable a kind of possibility for economy. So I, the project had to do with building models of the neighborhoods that uh, were, were going to be demolished in the next five years. I remember when I went to Paris for the first time and I went to the City Museum in Paris and I saw for the first time 
a great idea that somebody had where I stole it actually, uh, that to build the models of the uh, neighborhoods that Hausmann destroyed. And this is uh, many, many years ago. Uh, but it was the only memory. Uh, uh, so the models became evidence. I'm interested in this idea of ev evidentiary type of information that, uh, that then serves as a mediating tool to, the, to construct debate. I'm very interested in Chantal Mouffe's notion that public space is a battleground on which uh, the, he the he hegemony of uh, different uh, projects or institutions of power are exposed and confronted without any kind of possibility of reconciliation. The visualization of conflict in this case is suggests, as she calls it, an agonistic model. The, the idea is to intervene in the debate itself. So we use the models as the excuse to do that. It was an eight-month project that was very arduous and really difficult dealing with the bureaucracy in Korea. But we uh, connected to these neighborhoods and built these models in uh, uh, collaboration with community activists, children, and university students. They got really obsessed, and they really built the models with such accuracy uh, to really understand the kind of fabric, the, the alleys, the, 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 uh, the, a man who had built a, a snail farm on three rooftops, uh, uh, two families that, that, that collaborated to produce a small playground. These uh, uh, entrepreneurial efforts, it's all, all of that was being eroded by these new developments. And as we were building the models, we were having discussions and conversations with the, uh, with the different factions that were at odds with one another, the, 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 the activists who, in fact, were not informed of really what they had, the power of their spaces, and that the models began to really uh, uh, enable, uh, or the, um, the designers of these towers that were explaining how they learned from uh, Le Corbusier, and now they were <laughs> translating uh, uh, the recipes, uh, to the developers, that were, of course, the part of the issue here is a kind of monopoly between housing authority, contractors, construction companies, and government, uh, and uh, the kind of uh, the, the, the activists also, the, 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 the Catholic Church in Korea is very powerful in the way that they, so the interviewing of all these stakeholders and bringing them together virtually to produce eventually what became a Bill of Rights for the neighborhood. Uh, ten points that were presented to the mayor of Anyang, which is the city where we were working, suggesting very different ideas about development that could involve. Because we were not just saying, let's preserve these, mo these neighborhoods. We were saying, if you are going to construct a new neighborhood, transfer the values of this community. If we, if all of these projects are a learning experience for all of us. I began to understand that the community is about this sort of aspirations, these values, but the neighborhood is a physicalization of those values, and that's something that really needed to be transferred, as we also need to in, in, in intensify our uh, idea of density. Final, uh, I meant to say that I wanted to share one fa uh, important inspiration or quote in the beginning by General Petraeus, now the second one, really, to finish, uh, is uh, something that um, um, an artist friend of mine, a performance, Artist, a very famous uh, Cuban-American performer. This has been the great thing about teaching at UCSD in the Visual Arts Department, is that the discussion has really opened up a relationship to many other uh, creative fields. Uh, Tania Bruguera, a performance artist, Cuban-American, once in, in, in a meeting uh, told me, you know what, Teddy, this is the time, she said, to return or to restore Duchamp's urinal to the bathroom. And in that sense, and this is actually the bathroom of the visual arts department, what I began to understand is that what we were really looking for, or at least what the aspiration at this moment, is to produce a more functional relationship to the existing, a more functional relationship between art, architecture, and many of the fields that really uh, we are participating of, uh, a more functional relationship between them and the everyday, and the construction of the city, which would, of course, speak of the construction of a new imagination, a new type of civic awareness and, and civic imagination. This has been, for me, the most inspirational part of the work in the last 10 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for coming. I look forward to talking to people. I need one of those. Uh, can I, can I use yes. Thank you. Can, Thanks can so I, much. Uh, no, I, Here, you can have the, the other half of it. OK, thank you. Good. Um, All right. I'll have a pocket. We here. could use your help. What do you need? Could could you come right over here for us? My hat. Oh yeah. Oh you want oh. 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 Oh.
that. <laughs> John, you can take her in here, right? Can you come with me this way. All right. Thank <laughs> you. 